All right, well, good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you for uh, joining us for this community conversation. Uh, for those of you that joined us two weeks ago, um, a lot continues to change. And uh, for those of you that this is your first time joining us, uh, thank you for doing so. Uh, we think it's important on a regular basis to hear from the various uh, different local governmental entities and, and other public entities who are all working hard in their uh, unique spaces uh, to ultimately do the best thing for our for our broad single community. So um, we thank each of them for taking some time uh, out of their schedules today. I know for some of you it is a holiday today. Um, and I guess I, I want to I want to not forget to say before we end this that I hope everyone through all of our busyness and craziness is uh, able to to uh, enjoy a little bit of time away from this uh, this weekend uh, with your uh, small families uh, as we continue to do our, our parts to uh, to social distance uh, here, even though we have a holiday weekend coming up here for many of us. Um, just a couple housekeeping notes as we get started. Uh, we do have this set uh, so that all of your lines will be muted. Um, just uh, if you've been on Zoom calls, I think they're, they're better managed that way. And um, we will use the chat feature if any of you do have questions uh, that you want any of our leadership team to um, respond to. Uh, we'll be watching for that and we'll try and reserve some time at the end of this uh, conversation to address uh, some of those uh, particular questions. So feel free to use that chat feature. Uh, our agenda today is very similar to what it was two weeks ago. Uh, we will kick off this conversation with some remarks from Marion's, uh, Mayor Nakabawasli. Uh, followed by our city manager, Lon Pluckhan. And then we have superintendents uh, from both the Marion Independent and the Lindmar Community School District on the line with us, uh, both Janelle Brower and Shannon Bisgard. I'm using someone else's office, and of course, that's the one phone I forgot to mute. Um, and then we also have uh, Representative Ashley Hinson and Senator Liz Mathis on the call with us here today to provide some uh, perspective uh, at the state level as well. As you all know, uh, if we would put out an agenda and details on Monday, by this time today, uh, those details would change. We're in a very fluid situation. Uh, I think we've heard lots of new information over the past week from our educators. We know that uh, this conversation today is, is timely in that regard. And really all entities are just continuing to uh, respond and support our community in the best way we can with the information that we have and know. So uh, with that, I'm gonna open up the line and uh, invite Mayor Abawasli to provide uh, some initial comments as we uh, start this meeting. Mayor Nick, thanks for joining us. Good morning. Thank you very much for hosting this again. Um, really appreciate your doing that and the opportunity to, to be part of it. Um, I just wanna start by uh, saying uh, to uh, everyone who's joining us, as well as to the community at large, if you celebrate the, the Easter holiday, then you have my best wishes for, for a happy holiday, uh, uh, given the, the circumstances, and uh, I hope you um, have a, a very blessed uh, holiday. Uh, I uh, just want to start by saying, um, you know, the, the city, this is obviously a, a, a continuing to change uh, 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 the situation is continuing to change all the time, and uh, so we, we we are adjusting with it as uh, as each day comes. Uh, although I think uh, many as many organizations we've settled into uh, somewhat of a routine and figured out uh, how to handle things. Uh, we the, the city team, as I said uh, during the last one, uh, really reacted ver very swiftly uh, to uh, figure out how to protect first of all uh, people people's health, our own employees as well as the public. Uh, and, um, and then how to continue uh, serving the public and providing the services that we all need, uh, uh, that, that we all depend on uh, uh, during this situation and, and how to do that with uh, most of our employees working from home um, and continuing the communication, which is so important at a time like this is to, to continue communication. So we've all adjusted, we found ways to do that. Uh, we've all become very, very, uh, familiar. I'm not going to say I'm proficient, but very familiar with the uh, with uh, Zoom and uh, all of the uh, electronic means of of communicating. So uh, I, I want to thank again our city team for all that they've done and and all that they continue doing and will and will continue doing uh, to make sure that uh, we're serving the needs of the public and helping people solve issues and providing services um, 
as best as we can during this um, this situation. Uh, our council uh, had our first electronic, fully electronic meeting uh, last night, and I think that uh, went fairly well. A couple of glitches, but uh, in general, um, I was very pleased with how that turned out, and uh, we may have to do it several more times until we figure out uh, where this is headed. Um, we've been coordinating uh, again from day one on a daily basis with the regional entities, uh, keeping up with the situation, keeping up with the with the uh, messaging that needs to go out, the the, uh, the 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 impact on the on the community, uh, hearing from the medical community about what their needs are, hearing from um, all uh, uh, types of uh, services organizations about the needs that they're seeing, and trying to make sure that we're serving. Um, the needs as much as possible um, and uh, coordinating uh, daily again with uh, Medco and the Chamber of Commerce uh, on the needs of the business community and uh, just want to say that they have been doing an, an excellent job and uh, they're they have always been partners with the city on everything we do and uh, especially in this situation I think they've been terrific partners um, in providing the resources and the guidance that businesses need um, to make it through um, as successfully as possible uh, through uh, through this um, crisis, um, I want to thank uh, all the people in our entire region and across the state who are keeping uh, things going. Um, the, for, of course, the healthcare providers, the healthcare industry that are that are taking care of people, um, but also uh, the people who are keeping our stores open and keeping the supplies coming, uh, so that we can all have the the access to the things that we need um, and the community at large. I think uh, Iowans have shown uh, who they are in this uh, situation. They have listened by and large. I, I think that people are um, paying attention to the guidance uh, that's coming from um, our state and our local uh, uh, public health department uh, about, uh, about things that we need, all need to be doing, uh, you know, this in, in a situation where we don't really control uh, very much. Uh, this is one way where we all have a, a role to play, which is to do our part to, to slow the spread of the virus. And the virus can't spread without the help of people. And so uh, we continue to reinforce the, the, the guidelines about distancing um, and uh, of course, cleaning uh, frequently touched surfaces, surfaces uh, often. Uh, and um, covering your cough, all those the guidances that, that, that have been, uh, uh, that we've all become familiar with, we continue to reinforce those, encourage people to, to um, practice those, uh, uh, practice those and to help slow the spread uh, of the virus. Um, and as we distance uh, from other people physically, we want to be sure that uh, we all remember that, um, uh, physical distance does not have to be social uh, distance uh, or social isolation. We, we uh, want to be sure that uh, we're taking care of our mental health, our physical health, uh, continue to, to, as the weather improves, to go outside and, and exercise and uh, enjoy um, the nice weather. And uh, also just reminding everyone that we may, uh, you know, we all know people that may be struggling. Everyone is going to be impacted by this situation in one way or another, whether financially, uh, whether emotionally. Um, so to, just to, to, to show who we are again as a community uh, by looking in on each other, by checking up on people who we know may need our help or may need a little bit of assistance or just someone to talk to. Um, uh, we can come together in many, many ways that don't require being uh, up close to each other. Uh, you know, there's, I'm sure there are people who are experiencing anxiety um, and maybe some isolation as a result of this. And we want to uh, just be there for each other as a community to make sure that people have access to the resources that they need. Um, our uh, COVID page on the city website uh, does have the hotline information for people that may need uh, crisis uh, help and resources. Um, and I, I, it's my understanding that the Gazette uh, coronavirus resource page, uh, as of today, will also have uh, those uh, 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 that information, those those phone numbers, 
uh, that can be reached uh, by people who um, need uh, need some assistance. Um, I think that covers what I had to say. Uh, I'm uh, proud of our community. I think, uh, like I said, people are responding um, and um, just want to encourage everyone to uh, um, continue to look forward uh, to uh, better days uh, once we are past this, uh, um, this situation. So thank you very much. Mayor Dick, thank you uh, again for your time. Thanks for your continued leadership. You and the council are doing a great job, so thank you for that. Uh, we'll swing over now and uh, talk to uh, Marion's uh, city manager, uh, Lon Pluckon. Uh, Lon, uh, what's your update from a city perspective? Well, uh, as the mayor said, I think one of the things that we're starting to see is um, initially with the disaster response, there was a decline in medical calls, police calls. Um, but in the last week or so, we've really started to see an uptick in those uh, calls for that I'd say are mental health related. And it wasn't an accident that uh, the press briefing from Lynn EMA yesterday focused on mental health and resources available for folks. Um, we're reaching the point where for those of them, those of us that might be a little extroverted like me, uh, the isolation is starting to get to you. And there are resources out there that people can tap into to help. Uh, if you have any questions about it, by all means, there's, there's listed on our website and they're also listed on the uh, Lynn County Public Health, Lynn County Emergency Management um, resources pages organization I think everybody's probably seen that we've made a lot of operational adjustments but now we're starting to turn towards thinking about what does it look like uh, in a month um, we're gonna reach a point where you know the grass in the parks is actively growing the ditches are starting to get overgrown so putting our plans together for really kind of the return to work portion of this once we get past the initial phases of the disaster response um, even starting to think about what does it look like when you have to reopen public facilities because uh, in the absence of a vaccine you know we're still going to be dealing with periodic outbreaks and people that test positive you know the transmissibility of this doesn't change um, based on um, getting past the initial peak with self-isolation and the other techniques that we're going through now. So, you know, those of us with um, extremely public buildings, think, think about things like the library. What does that look like when you reopen the library and then we find out a couple of weeks in that there's been someone in there who's tested positive. Um, it will change the way that we operate. We'll have to have some new protocols in place for um, temporary closures, deep cleaning buildings. Um, we have reached out to our regional partners to develop a standard that um, would really work and be agreed upon upon all of us. So we're all just working out of that same playbook. So um, not trying to get too far ahead of the horse, knowing that we still got a lot of work to do between now and the end of the disaster declaration to make sure that we're preserving the public health and safety. But also then um, the next piece is what does business look like once we're past this initial phase and um, how do we continue to best serve the community going forward? All right, thank you. Thank you, Lon, uh, for that update. Um, city team's doing a great job. Um, our school folks are working hard too. I think, uh, you know, in the last week, um, you've, you've heard new announcements as far as school closures are concerned and, and concerned and new requirements and planning that our districts are needing to do to kind of look forward into the latter half of, of April and keep thinking about, you know, what does the next month look like as, as new announcements continue to be made. So we'll pivot to talk about our K-12 systems. And uh, for that, I'm gonna start with uh, Linmar Superintendent Shannon Bisgard. Uh, Shannon, we'll have you go first. Thanks for being here. Uh, thanks for having us, Nick, to share our updates between Linmar and Marion as well. Uh, appreciate to be part of the conversation. Um, as Nick mentioned, uh, we are, the governor announced uh, about a week ago, we were closed um, through schools through April 30th in Iowa. Um, so really we're kind of in a two to three week cycle, it feels like, of um, get new information, make some plans, um, and then we adjust that every uh, week to two weeks as information becomes readily available to us. And that's, that's exactly the stage we're in now. Um, we do anticipate new news from the governor uh, next week about the remaining days for the school year as well. Um, so what I'm going to talk about today, just a real brief, brief, what do we know right now and what are we doing? And then uh, some things we don't know as well, and we're waiting for more information um, to come our way as well. So first of all, a couple of things we've continued since we started in this um, 
COVID-19 crisis planning stage. We are still planning to offer um, student lunches at all of our um, 10 locations that we have, six school locations and four offsite. Um, we're about 1,500 meals a day is our average right now. We're doing that every day. Um, and every student that comes for a, um, a lunch, they also get a lunch for that day and a breakfast for the next day. And those numbers continue to climb. Uh, we served about 1,800 meals yesterday. I don't think those numbers will slow down. I think they will continue to increase. So we'll continue to offer that for as long as our um, schools are closed. Um, we have committed again, our board has, to continue to pay our staff and to work from home, um, except for a couple of essential employees coming into work. I think that's really important. Um, provide that stability uh, financially and uh, mental health reasons, as you've heard a couple others mention already today. Um, we continue to offer childcare at two of our locations, um, a very small setup hand in hand in the YMCA. We're using two of our facilities to provide that um, service so we can um, allow some families to continue to work as needed. Um, a very small turnout for those, about 40 students total. And we're able to spread those out into small groups um, in our facilities to keep um, within the guidelines of the um, 10 students or less at a time. We have closed our playgrounds um, along with Marion Independent and the City of Marion as well. Um, it's impossible to keep up with cleaning and keeping small groups um, small in those locations. We have closed those. Um, construction at our two new schools has been impacted by coronavirus like everything has, but at the same time, progress does continue at both sites. Um, so we are still scheduled to open in August and hoping and planning that is what will be the end result. But uh, there has been impact there with construction workers having challenges like we all are health wise and workforce wise, as well as supply chain challenge. So that continues to be Something we monitor closely, but we've been pleased that progress has been able to continue. Uh, the big change that we have since the last time we met in two weeks is our um, ways we're providing education for students. The guidance from the state has changed and the options available to us have changed as well. We now have three options um, to choose from as a, a district. Um, we are choosing two of the three options and we'll explain that in just a minute here. Uh, the three options every district in Iowa had to decide by today what our choices were. We can always make adjustments in that plan, but we had to submit that plan to the DE today. So our um, options of the three, one of the options is to do nothing, uh, literally provide no resources, and essentially there is no school. We're not choosing that option at all. Um, so the second option is vocational, our, I'm sorry, voluntary educational enrichment opportunities. Um, this is what we have essentially been doing since the, we came back from spring break and schools were closed, um, where we provide resources available to families to continue to work um, best they can to keep kids learning moving forward in a voluntary format. We're gonna continue to do that with our preschoolers through eighth graders um, going forward starting Monday. The new option that was available to us um, in the criteria is required educational services. And this one's a little bit different and we are choosing this option for our high school students on um, ninth through 12th grade classes. Um, it's essentially, but like it says, it's required learning. Um, it, we're looking at a very modified high school day that will be done online as much as we possibly can. Uh, trying to give kids a lot of flexible ways they can learn anytime, any place. We have a shortened, modified school schedule, but at the same time, if students aren't able to be there Monday at 8.30, they can log in later on that night or the next day, um, and watch the recorded lessons and get the support uh, from teachers that way as well. And then those classes are credit earning classes that go out towards graduation and they are graded as well. Uh, we know it can't be school as normal though, so we've done a lot of modifications to that. Um, for example, for the grading piece, students will have the option to um, take their letter grade at the end of the quarter if they're happy with that, or they can go in and choose some credit or no credit option if that's a better option for them. Uh, so we've made some modifications to our normal way of doing things, uh, trying to provide some flexibility uh, for students. Everybody has unique needs right now. Uh, we're trying to recognize that and be respectful of that while still providing education best we can. And then the last update I have for you and things that we do know is we have moved to um, board meetings in a Zoom format, similar to what we're doing right now. Uh, as Nick mentioned, the city had their first council meeting in that format and we had our first school board meeting on Monday night in that format. It went very well. We were pleased to see we had more people participate in that format of a board meeting than our normal board meetings. But that was interesting and a nice um, side benefit of um, going this route. We will continue to offer our regular board meetings um, at seven o'clock on Mondays. 
of course, Mondays are monthly typically um, in the Zoom format. So if people are interested in logging in and um, join us, we'd be glad to have that as well. A couple of things we don't know yet is what happens after April 30th. Um, like I said, we hope to find out new information soon. Um, but as of now, there's kind of a holding pattern there on things such as activities and athletics. Prom is probably the second biggest question we get. What is going to happen with prom? We don't know yet on that one. Ours is scheduled into May, so we are on a holding pattern there. Uh, um, and then graduation is the biggest one we get. Uh, we are still waiting to see what happens with the, if we are allowed to come back to school. And if we are not, what does that look like? Um, we'll find some ways to recognize our seniors, um, either um, in traditional format or in a modified virtual format as well, because I think that's really important. So other than that, um, we do hope to hear from the governor next week about future um, timelines, or if not next week, hopefully the week after, so we can continue with our planning and moving forward as well. So, thank you. Okay, thanks, Shannon. Appreciate that update. Um, we want to hear now from uh, Janelle Brower. Um, she's the superintendent of the Marion Independent School District. Uh, Janelle, go ahead. Thanks for joining us. Absolutely. Thanks again for posting this. And similar to last time, I had the opportunity to go first and Shannon had the opportunity to say ditto. This time we're in reverse order. So much of what you just heard from, from, um, from Shannon will be very similar in Marion Independent. Um, we have collaborated around a lot of this recognizing that we, we serve one community. And so it's been important to us to be on the same page where we can so that we're meeting the needs of our community as a whole. Uh, and, and so I would just extend a thank you for that. I really appreciate that partnership. Uh, I will say, um, again, like Lenmar, we are, we are closed through April 30th. Our hope is to, re to be able to return um, to the buildings May 1st, but again, we're waiting on um, more information from the governor in the upcoming week and certainly putting um, safety of all those involved uh, at the forefront of that decision making. So. Although we're eager to be back in session, um, we recognize that um, we want safety for everybody involved to come first. Our board meetings uh, have moved to an online format. The first meeting went very well. Um, our most recent meeting, we had a lot more feedback um, on microphones, and so that's something we're continuing to work through um, as we learn. But we've used a Google Hangout format with a call-in um, number. And again, have had um, some community participation in that as well, which is appreciated. Uh, we have our next board meeting scheduled. It was initially scheduled for April 13th. We're moving that to April 20th. So next board meeting, April 20th. Um, and again, that will be online. Staff meetings and parent-student contacts are taking place um, in a variety of formats. Our staff are meeting pretty regularly, um, virtually, whether that be through Zoom meetings or Google Hangout. Uh, we are reaching out to families um, by phone, by email, um, through online formats and, and trying to meet families where they're at in that contact. Um, right now, I would say where we're at as a district is hoping for the best. Um, which would be we return May 1st, but we're also planning for the worst um, because we need to be thoughtful in planning forward um, in the event that we're unable to um, come back. So that really led to a lot of our decision making around um, continuous learning and which options to select. Very similar to Linmar um, with regard to Marion's decision making. Uh, we are continuing in the voluntary ed educational enrichment opportunities for our preschool through eighth grade students. Uh, we are, however, as a staff really working on where do we extend some of those lessons. Initially, um, we started with a list of, of resources for parents to access. Um, staff are starting to work on curating additional lessons with some of the content that students may otherwise miss out on. Um, so we'll, we'll be working on a weekly basis to push out additional lessons for families. Um, we also are working with many families on where do we reduce barriers, whether that be um, just access to some of the lessons on digital format and can we put um, paper in people's hands where that's possible and safe, um, both for our staff as well as for families. But pre-K eight through eight will continue with voluntary. Um, the message around that has really been 
access what you are able to as a family. We recognize that families are in different places and if families want more, we have teachers eager to help and support and provide suggestions um, in what additional opportunities could be. And if families are not in a place to be able to access some of our learning resources, um, that's okay. It's really at, at the level of what families are able to um, engage in. Learning takes place in a lot of different ways right now. Um, and so we realize that there's gonna be some gaps in learning, but um, we're also encouraging families to celebrate the opportunities you may not otherwise have. Um, making a meal together as a family, taking a walk in the evening and admiring nature that you don't have time to in, um, in regular life. So there are some slow down opportunities that are presenting different learning um, for our students. And it's okay for families to embrace those as well. As far as our high school students, um, starting April 20th, that's our kickoff for the required educational um, services. Much of that will be in online format, but not all students have access um, to online, whether it be, everybody has a device, but internet access is a concern. Um, so we're looking at where can we provide paper resources for some families. Um, we also are trying to put um, hotspots where possible with families who may not have that. However, we know there's a barrier with hotspots. Um, we're concerned that uh, just data plans are going to be limited with some of the online meetings. And so those are issues we're working to address, um, ensuring that access can be maintained over the course of a month, um, even if it's with a, with a subscription for a device. Um, beyond that, uh, like, Shannon mentioned, we're looking at um, letter grades for those high school courses, assigning credit, but recognizing this will be new learning for a lot of our teachers as well as students. So if there's a student who's struggling, we are looking at offering um, pass, no credit options to the extent possible. That's a little bit of an unknown with our ninth through 11th grade kids as to how that could potentially impact their future um, applications for college. We're pretty comfortable with our, with our seniors, um, but wanna make sure that we're not doing anything now that could have a negative impact for a, a college or a freshman applying to college in four years. Um, so our, our goal will be do no harm during the closure. Uh, as far as school meals, we continue to serve. We're um, serving over 300 students per day. Right now for Marion, we've moved to one central location. Um, that, that has really allowed us to stream things for staff and families. So all meals are served at Vernon Middle School, Mondays and Thursdays, and students pick up um, bagged meals for Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday on Monday, and for Thursday, Friday on Thursdays. So Mondays and Thursdays, 6.30 to 8.30 and 10 to 12 at Vernon Middle School. Um, and the, the last thing I just want, um, I want to share, and I think we've had a lot of community recognition for this. So this is, this is a thank you extended to everybody. Um, our staff are working to support the students that they work with all year, but they're also in the unique situation of supporting their own families and the learning for their own children. Um, so we just ask for um, grace and understanding and the fact that when they're providing an online lesson for a high school um, class, it may not be uncommon for their own child to interrupt that lesson. Um, and so this will be new learning for us. Um, we, are, we are excited and embracing the learning and I think it will make us better in the long run. Um, but there will be some bumps along the way. So we, we appreciate the understanding that um, our community has, has shared and extended to us. Um, and with that, I'll just turn it back to you, Nick. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Janelle. I was on a Zoom call yesterday and all of a sudden a cat jumped out of the side of the screen and literally landed on the shoulders of the person I was talking with. So we've all uh, seen those instances play out, kids or pets or whatever distractions that we all uh, live in the middle of. Um, uh, with that, we wanna to pivot to the state level. Uh, we know that uh, there continues to be just a multitude of responses uh, from, from the state and the federal level, um, whether we're talking about uh, grants uh, that we're hearing about being, being issued in the past week to business, whether we're 
understanding really the unemployment situation and how Iowa Workforce Development is, is just working as hard as they can to, to process all of the requests that are coming in, uh, understanding long-term to our businesses uh, what kind of that situation could mean to them. We, we could get into the lots of details quickly, but uh, we brought our uh, uh, our go-to folks uh, online here today, both Senator Liz Mathis and Representative Ashley Hinson, to provide some uh, perspective and comments from the state level. And I think this week we decided we're going to start with uh, Representative Hinson. So, Ashley, thank you for being here today. Yep. Thank you, everybody, for joining the call again today. Um, the sun is shining, and we have a lot to be thankful for. So I think we should all remember that on this Good Friday. And uh, I know, Janelle, when I was listening to you talk about those unplanned family moments that we now have time for, um, we are definitely trying to embrace those in our household. And we've done um, a lot of, uh, we've watched all the Thor movies, I think all of the Avengers movies together as a family. And we, we've gotten into Lego masters lately. So uh, we've been doing a lot of building challenges, which is a STEM activity um, in our house. So we're definitely trying to do that in addition to um, all of the uh, Prodigy and Lexi and all that fun stuff. So um, I wanted to give an update today and Senator Mathis and I, again, we talked um, yesterday to try to figure out, you know, how to get you the best information. So we're not duplicating on this call. So she's going to again address like last time, um, some more of the small business programs that are existing in the state of Iowa. But I just wanted to kind of give an update on um, the money that's come in so far and kind of what that's looking like. Um, the governor's office this morning got back to me. We have not yet received at the state level uh, $1.25 billion from the federal government yet or or the guidance on what that will look like. Um, it is going to be very finite in terms of um, being used specifically for coronavirus response. We know that, so it can't just be used to backfill any loss of tax revenue um, or you know, to fund any government priority. It has to be specifically used for um, coronavirus response. And we do know that much, but we'll get specifics hopefully um, sometime next week on what that uh, actually will look like. Um, we have received the CARES Act funding for um, new unemployment. That uh, was a deposit in the Iowa Workforce Development Account. Um, $350 million came in um, on the 7th, so that was um, Tuesday, um, to pay for benefits under the uh, Pandemic Emergency Unemployment Compensation Program, the Pandemic Unemployment Assistance Program, and then the Pand Pandemic Unemployment Compensation Program. So those three programs are being funded. $350 million came in. Um, I think a lot of the concerns that I've been hearing from constituents as far as um, receiving funding and applying for some of these programs, uh, many have tried to enroll in the Paycheck Protection Program and Payroll Protection Program at the federal level. Um, many applied right away as soon as that program ended. Um, and I've heard for a lot from those folks this week who were just wanting answers on where that was. Um, so we've been very involved in uh, coordinating with our federal delegation to, to figure out where that is. But um, someone I heard from, just to give you um, an, an example, yesterday morning who was like, I, I want to know where my approval is so I can get rolling with my lender. Um, they heard from uh, the PPP by the afternoon that they were approved. And so they were able to roll. So I, I would just say, if you are in that queue, be patient. Um, as you can imagine, the volume of applications is extremely high right now. So um, if we can be of assistance, please let us know. Um, we're in regular communication with the federal delegation, but um, just please um, don't feel afraid, don't be afraid to contact either myself or Senator Mathis or Representative Donahue. Um, there are concerns ahead and um, Representative, uh, Senator Mathis and I were both on an email chain this week dealing with um, a constituent in Marion who is concerned about making their lease payments going forward. Um, one of the things that I've been working on um, with the governor's office is looking forward um, when we're beyond just aid programs, but could there be a new revolving loan fund perhaps um, where businesses can draw from that maybe through Iowa Finance Authority um, so that they could use those maybe funds to cover their lease payments and then pay them back. So. Um, I'm working on something on that. And as soon as, hopefully we'll have an update on that in a couple of weeks, but that is something that I've been kind of working on in the past week. Um, a couple other updates. Uh, we're all taking part in a call at 9 a.m. every day with Lynn County. Um, we're listening into that call so we can get the latest updates for you um, for the response from COVID-19. And then all of your Lynn County legislators are invited to participate in a Tuesday and Thursday call at 10 a.m. with our federal delegation. And one topic that's come up I would say, um, I think it's come up on pretty much every call we've been on so far, but it's dealing with fraud and gouging. And that's something I think everybody is very concerned with um, in this time. I know uh, two weeks ago when we did this, was that two weeks ago or was that last week? Two weeks ago, okay. 
it's all blending together. Um, we did, uh, I did share with you that the Department of Justice was working on trying to collect incidents of fraud and gouging. And so I'm actually, I've got it typed into the chat here. I'm gonna share again, the hotline number and the email address. So if you're hearing of incidents um, of fraud or gouging, please contact that phone number. It's a hotline and an email address. Um, they have a task force that they're working to address some of those, uh, those scams, robocalls, social media scams, um, sales of counterfeit testing kits. We're hearing a lot about those. Um, so if you're hearing about those kinds of things, please don't feel bad about reporting them. Um, no tip is a dumb tip at this point. Um, and Steve O'Connick, our emergency uh, management coordinator here in Lynn County, mentioned that N95 masks, for instance, which normally are about a dollar, are sometimes going for five or six dollars right now. So you can imagine that's an incredible cost to all of us as taxpayers going forward and dealing with um, the challenges associated with um, getting the personal protective equipment that we need. Um, one issue that came up on our call yesterday was that we need gowns. So if you know of some place that has disposable gowns, that is definitely an immediate need that we need to get um, to our, our local health care providers for that personal protective equipment. Um, additionally, the White House is holding a call every Wednesday. Um, we get to hear from administration officials about the response, and Senator Mathis and I are both taking part in those. Um, the Treasury does expect the electronic payments will start to be made uh, for the, uh, the benefit uh, program um, through the CARES Act. We'll start around April 15th. They have banking information for about 60 million taxpayers. They'll be a part of that first round of payments. Social security recipients, and this is I think a really important um, outcome of that call Wednesday, but there are a lot of people who do not file tax returns and they will automatically receive the economic impact statements. They'll get them just as a direct deposit or by a paper check as they would normally receive their benefits. So that's important for folks who were worried about how that money was maybe gonna come in um, for some of our seniors. Um, and they all are also the Treasury establishing a um, portal. So they're going to be sensitive to the fact that there are a number of people who don't use banks or financial institutions. Um, and some of those people are right here in Marion. So we want to make sure that they can still get their benefits. And so um, they are going to have a, a portal available where people can enter in their information there. Um, and then I think a really important development yesterday that will help our cities as well as our states, but um, the Treasury did make an investment in the Municipal Liquidity Facility Fund, um, additional $500 billion in direct financing to states, counties, and cities. Um, that's really important. As you all know, we're seeing that reduction in tax revenue coming in right now, um, and our expenses are definitely not going down. So um, that will hopefully be helpful um, as well. Um, and then finally, uh, what I also wanted to update a little bit of a, a cap around on higher education and thanks again to our, our superintendents for, for their updates. Um, this is a definite moving target and every week it seems like there's more information, but um, on Monday, the Department of Ed did get the waiver to give districts uh, flexibility with federal money. We're gonna continue to get more guidelines on how that will work. Um, we do know that um, some of that CARES funding then will be dedicated to tech infrastructure and teacher training on continuous learning during this emergency. And so um, that's all in motion. They are doing public comments. So if you're interested in that, just log on to the Department of Ed's website. Um, all three of our universities have moved to entirely virtual instruction at this point. Um, as to access, I know Janelle, you touched on this, it's tough. Some people just don't have that, uh, that internet access. Um, so ISU has Wi-Fi parking lots near Jack Trice right now. Um, they've done that to try to enable people to come socially distance and still do their school. Um, University of Iowa is focusing on long-term implications for student learning research and clinical care. And then UNI is reporting, um, this all came out of the Board of Regents meeting, by the way, just a, an update there. But they are reporting that um, the Iowa Department of Ed is also relaxing student teaching requirements going forward. There are 270 fourth year ed students. They've been working with them to make sure that they can begin teaching in pre-K through 12 schools next fall. So where they may have not gotten all the hours they needed for that student teaching. Um, you know, we're still hearing from our student teacher, she's emailing uh, my, my boys, but um, they are gonna work with them and be more flexible so that they're ready to go in the workforce in the fall. So. Um, one last thing, and then I'll pass it off to you, uh, Liz, but um, we have estimates of what um, that higher ed funding will look like coming from the CARES Act. And right now it looks like University of Iowa is gonna get $16.6 .6 million. 
Iowa State, 22.9 million. University of Northern Iowa would get 8.1 million. And then as if our community colleges go, um, Kirkwood would get about 5.9 million. So that's kind of the preliminary breakdown from LSA on what we could be getting in terms of funding um, from the CARES Act for higher ed. So um, that's my brief in a nutshell. Sorry for the big download of information, but um, a lot happening right now. Okay, thanks, Ashley. Um, and, and thank all of you for joining us today. I know there are several business people on this call. Um, you know, Ashley may be doing uh, Legos with her kids, but I'm just trying to keep my husband away from the refrigerator so we both don't, you know, uh, add that COVID-19 that they're talking about, you know, the 19 pounds of being in isolation. So, um, Lon, I can see you laughing about that, but you know, it's, I tell you what, we, we gotta keep away from the fridge. Um, so as Ashley said, I was going to talk a little bit more from a, a lower level of state business and uh, what opportunities are there for state, uh, for businesses, local businesses to apply for and what kinds of loans. So we've reviewed this before that there's a small business program. Just this week, the governor announced that she added uh, 20 million to that small business grant relief program, which brings it to a total of 24 million. And um, th that, that's terrific. They had 14,000 applications for that money initially. So what they're gonna do is um, they've already awarded the first round and I think they awarded about 500 and some, 503 Iowa small businesses received between 5,000 and $25,000. There's a list on the IEDA website if you wanna go look at it. We received a list, several Lynn County businesses received money. I know Roasters Coffee did in Hiawatha. Um, you know, because a lot of the businesses are just closed. There's no business coming in. Um, they're going to take a look. IEDA is going to take a look at that remaining pool. So the remaining pool then will be awarded uh, that money that's been added to the pool. Unfortunately, you know, there were several local businesses, and I, you know, I know one for certain, and I've been in contact with her, that missed the deadline for this. And I want to talk to the governor about, or even Debbie Durham about, maybe opening it back up when they might realize that some of the applications or the applicants are deciding they don't need that money, but opening that, that application process back up again. Because several small businesses, uh, when they closed, they laid off people, and then what small uh, you know, uh, uh, orders they had left they were actually filling those orders and didn't have enough time to apply for this. And so they were really enmeshed in trying to keep their businesses going and really not focused as much on applying for a loan so, uh, or this grant. So we're hoping that um, maybe that will happen. But for now, they're gonna just consider um, you know, what applicants came in the door the first time around. And IEDA, IEDA, other programs, um, and, and many of you businesses already know this, this Targeted Small Business Sole Operator Program, the fund has been created to um, really help those with just zero employees. You know, you're just running, running the show from home or you, you have a small lease space or something like that. Then there's Iowa Business Tax Deferral. So the application for deferral of eligible taxes and waiver of penalty and interest remains through April 30th. They also announced yesterday, the Iowa Department of Revenue announced that they have issued an order to provide conditional relief from penalties for estimated tax payments. And you'll wanna loop in with your accountant on that. You'll wanna also just take a look at what, what um, the Iowa Department of Revenue has on their website right now. Um, you will not be penalized for underpayment right now as we know it. And then of course, there's the SBA disaster assistant loans um, that Ashley talked about. Um, I have talked to a couple of different businesses who do have their number and they do have an estimated amount of the award that they will receive. And if you tell um, SBA that you want that or you indicate on your application um, or tell your uh, financial lender, your financial services company that you want to do it. Um, that process has started, but there is no indication of when that money is going to flow. And I think that's what we're most worried about is when that money will come to help relieve our businesses. We've heard at, on Capitol Hill and at a state level, a lot of people saying some of this is just um, 
you know, kind of a half-hearted, half-measured, uh, 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 you know, way to dis distribute money. And we want to make sure that businesses get what they need when they need it. So we'll keep the pressure on. I know uh, Representative Hinson and I and Representative Donahue have been talking with our, our um, you know, our Capitol Hill legislators, our federal legislators on asking when and how much and what does the next stimulus bill look like um, that they're working on number four. Um, <clears throat> we also had unemployment claims. So um, for you businesses out there, the surge of jobless claims was at 6.6 .6 million prior to COVID-19 and then more than 17 million claims have been filed in the last four weeks alone at a federal level. So, um, you know, predictions are that the unemployment rate might hit 12%. We haven't seen any of that yet because of course, you know, weekly the unemployment claim number comes out. Um, right now, uh, Beth Townsend, the director of IWD says that um, they've been trying to pay claims within 10 days of filing. Um, I was working with a whole family. It was a mom, dad, uh, and daughter and son who uh, were all, you know, they'd all, they're all living together and they're trying to figure out, you know, how they're going to balance their checkbook. Um, and um, the gentleman, the father had received um, money into his checking account as of yesterday. So, um, so it is flowing. It is getting to uh, to the people who need it. Um, uh, employees who've been laid off. There's a really good video on the uh, Iowa Workforce Development site for not only employees but also employers. Just um, what your uh, role is in in unemployment claims. Um, and then, then Beth Townsend also announced a trigger. Uh, she announced a trigger of the unemployment trust fund that's currently at 1.3 billion. So this is how she described it to me in an email. The trigger is set at 950 million. And we're taking the step to be able to limit the impact of pandemic on employers moving forward. So she says, as it stands now, they're not charging employers with these charges. And it means that all of the charges are being borne by all the employers. So whether they have laid off staff or not, as the reduction in the balance of the account is what drives next year's tax rate. So, um, so that's the, that unemployment tax rate. So we're gonna keep our eyes on that. Um, we will, uh, you know, they, she said that they will get these claims paid again as fast as they can. Um, Ashley talked about the unemployment at the federal level and also at those federal reserve dollars that, that 2.3 trillion in loans that's gonna be released. Um, Healthcare from a national level, we've seen that a lot of money, uh, 27 billion is gonna go out in terms of help for to develop vaccines and therapeutics and uh, PPE and testing and supplies and healthcare providers or hospitals are going to uh, be able to uh, draw down some funds from the federal government. There's just a lot of money uh, uh, proposed, but we need to get that money flowing. Locally, I had a meeting with Iowa Department of Public Health this week, and um, we talked about just, um, you know, communication levels with county, how that's working. Um, they are daily having calls with um, the nursing home that has been affected, uh, heritage in our area, and uh, the overwhelming nature of that to that nursing home. Um, you've seen it in the news. Uh, they're working closely with them. Anecdotally, we've heard from providers that telehealth is really working and they're hoping that uh, we can keep it in place because they've been able to get to patients um, when they need it, where they need it, um, they, would they, and they wouldn't normally see these patients as frequently. So uh, perhaps because of around issues of transportation or other obstacles that may occur, but uh, the patients are liking it, their clients are liking it, and uh, the reimbursement is at a level that um, it's really um, incented to do. So I think that's a lesson for us to learn as we move forward in policy across, you know, um, as we hit our next budgets and we work on policy next year is to add that in and to keep that. Um, we're also uh, working on a daily basis uh, with the PPE uh, at a county level as Ashley discussed, but also um, IDPH talked about 
um, the development of what's called a strike force, that if something like what has happened at Heritage, if the staff you know, is, is, is infected and there are not enough staff to take care of who is well, that a strike force would come in, what would that strike force look like? Washington State has used it. So uh, they're examining perhaps if this would hit another skilled nursing facility, what a strike force would look like so we could help those patients. Um, and in child care, Director Garcia, Kelly Garcia, ha had a good conference call with uh, the Federal Administration for Children and Families, that's ASCF this week, and she told me that the conversations are going to continue. Um, complete guidance really isn't set up yet about that. However, they did learn that the states will be provided some great flexibility around child care dollars, so that's really good news. Um, and after that, I've got some uh, other extra information, and I know that um, Nick wanted to talk about this as to really what are our state budgets going to look like? And so that's a really good question, and we don't even really know how we're going to gather. We know we're going to gather after April 30th sometime, whether it's in May or June, we just don't know. But here's what, um, you know, 40 other states are in, you know, they have delayed income tax filing deadlines meaning April as well. Um, so normally, April is the best month for tax collections for states, and, and we're going to be short. Unfortunately, we're going to be short. So we're hoping that the economy is going to start to grow again in June. I mean, that's the best prediction. Um, and even if that plays out as hoped, um, there is an institute that does um, measuring, and they feel that each percentage point increase in the unemployment rate historically has led to a 3.7 percent drop in state revenues. So uh, figure that out, you know. Um, that's going to be uh, quite a drop, I think, for us. So we're asking the REC, the Revenue Estimating Conference, to go back to work and try to put pencil to paper and figure out what our sales tax revenue is going to look like before we can set our budgets moving forward. Now, other states have done some different things. So Minnesota, New York, Washington, D.C., Washington uh, State, and Kentucky have done some things. Kentucky just passed a one-year budget rather than they do their budgets in two-year increments. San Diego, the city of San Diego, is considering moving from an annual to a quarterly budget. New Jersey legislators are expected to vote next week to extend their current fiscal year from June to September. And so that's in part to just capture that, uh, you know, 2019 income tax filings that, that are now due in July for, for them too. And so there are some ideas as we go back to the state just to try to figure out, you know, how we're going to set these budgets. A um, lot of ideas floating around, but we got to get to it. And there are people at the Capitol that are working on it already. That's all I've got. Nick, we can't hear you. I thought I might actually get through a call without doing that, but unfortunately, <laughs> I not. We wanted to um, just, we'll get back to the topic of state finances in just a, in just a second, but I did want to not lose track of a comment that Supervisor Olson wanted me to forward on to all of you, and he is on the call, but, um, you know, as things are slowing down, at the same time, we're getting into a period of construction season. So um, you are going to start seeing um, those extra inconveniences show up in various corners of our community, which in a lot of ways is a good thing. You know, we're able to keep, keep the construction industry moving uh, in, a, in a safe way. But just specifically, he wanted to remind you all, especially for those of us around Marion, that um, the county plans to move forward with all road construction projects. Their major county home road project starts next week and large portions of County Home Road are gonna be closed with alternate routes. So they're adding lanes, turn lanes, there's a couple of significant roundabouts that are gonna get added uh, between Highway 13 and 380. So just a heads up, especially as you're uh, driving in that particular area, that project is still planning to start. And the same would go for various construction projects that I'm gonna assume you're gonna see all across the Metro. So wanted to get to that uh, note real quickly. Um, we did have a couple of questions that were submitted ahead of time, and, and I, I have shared these with um, 
Senator Mathis and Representative Henson. First question, since Iowa does have a large rainy day fund, what impact will the downturn have based on new tax revenue projections? And will the legislature work to keep, whether it's $500 million, a billion dollars in that fund for future catastrophes like this? Can, can either of you provide a, a, a little bit of context uh, on that particular question? Yeah, um, I'll go ahead and start, Liz. And um, I think it's important to note where we were, especially a few weeks ago going into this disaster. So the cash reserve fund had $587.9 million in it and the Economic Emergency Fund had 196 million. So those were full heading into this disaster. Um, as we know, you know, 25 million of that, so, so to speak, has already been spent on these um, small business programs, but um, we know that's not gonna be enough. So um, we, we anticipate that that will take a, a very big hit if not be depleted. So the way it kind of works, and I sent a, a document to Nick so he could pull it up and share it on his screen. So I think if you can do that now, it'd be great. I just wanted to kind of explain to people how um, the, the general fund flows into the cash reserve and then into the economic re emergency fund. So those kind of flow beyond the receipts that we would normally get um, and as well as our surplus carries forward and fills the cash reserve fund, uh, which has a maximum balance of 7.5% of our revenue. And then the economic emergency fund has a, max a maximum balance of 2.5%. So in essence, we're always... Uh, hopefully having 10% of our budget needs in these two funds with the cash reserve and the economic emergency fund. So um, they will um, see some depletion as a result of what we're going through. Um, and with this formula, any excess that would go forward, um, surplus carry forward and those types of things would flow into those funds automatically, but um, anticipating lower than normal revenue, um, we may have to take a look at how, uh, how we do that. Um, a couple of years ago when we had a deappropriation in our state budget, we actually came back and reappropriated money in the next year's budget when we knew receipts would be bigger to go ahead and fill in some of those funds. So um, that's kind of the mechanism that um, exists to do that. Um, there's a section of Iowa code that lays out how that process works. It's um, Iowa code 8.57. Um, so that kind of details how we would have to go through and refill that cash reserve fund. But um, I, th I think absolutely once this situation is resolved, we're going to have to look at the um, at those funds and make sure that we have uh, resources in those funds. It's very important to have the rainy day fund, so to speak, because we do need to continue to fund schools, our healthcare providers, and uh, our local governments as well. We have payments that are anticipated on those levels. And so um, so that's just kind of a brief explainer. I have this full document. Um, this is from the last budget year, but if you're interested in more information, please let me know and I can send that on to you too. And Liz, I think you had some additional comments on that. Yeah, yeah. I think that both states and municipalities um, went, went into this crisis with record levels of reserves on hand and, and our, our state was in really good shape. So uh, that's going to help as well as the federal assistance that we're going to get. So um, in, in answer to that question, I, I, I think we're in a pretty good position to start, but it's really too soon to see how deeply this is going to go. I, I know that um, you know, cities, the municipalities, counties, um, you know, when we had the Great Recession that ended in 2009, um, it took several years to dig out of that, um, not only at a state level, but also for our municipalities. And then I think even after some of our stay at home orders um, start to be lifted, the economy is going to restart in stages. So we have to remember that, that it's not going to be like Dr. Fauci told us. It, you know, the economy doesn't start when you, you, you turn on the light switch. It just doesn't do that. And I think um, Lon, uh, Mayor Nick, uh, a lot of people um, who, who deal with budgets, including Brent Olson, you know, can see that. You can see that by uh, revenues that are coming in at different times of the year and how you try to predict that and how you try to do city business. Um, and you can't store services. So we have to remember that when salons reopen, people are only going to pay for one haircut. They're not going to pay for all the haircuts they've missed. So we're going to have this gap and we have to kind of look at where, where are our tax revenues coming up short in what areas, in what businesses, uh, and, and then try to accommodate for that. And then states and uh, localities are now trying, trying to protect their emergency services and public safety and utilities from cuts. Um, so that puts more pressure on the rest of their budgets. So again, fixed costs, we'll be going through the budgets to, to figure out what are fixed costs, especially for education and for 
health and human services. Those will be our top priorities. Obviously, there are biggest expenditures. And then asking everybody, what are your wants and what are your needs? So it, it may be a belt tightening year, which it will be. I can say that it will be a belt tightening year that we're going to be funding needs uh, rather than wants. I had a question that has come up really in, in conversations, even with some of our um, even with some of our local lenders over the last couple of days, as they've been working with uh, PPP, for instance. And, and and just a sidebar on that, uh, my understanding is as companies have been working with their local lenders to apply for the PPP loans, um, the approvals have been coming reg relatively quickly. The the questions are how quickly can we actually close those loans? and get that cash into the hands of the companies. The particular lender I was talking with yesterday said they had just gotten the loan agreement from the SBA at the end of the day on Wednesday, so two days ago. In their minds, they were optimistically saying that they thought they might be in a position to start closing some loans by today, but perhaps best case scenario or worst case scenario, I'm sorry, would be first part of next week. So I think that's a little bit of the unknown as the approvals have come quickly is how fast can we actually close those. So that's just a, a story I would heard from the marketplace as of yesterday. Um, both to Liz and Ashley, one question that I've, I've gotten is, so the, the, the state small business relief grants, um, those were available, I believe, for companies that employ is it up to or, or just under 25. That's kind of the magic number. But what about for those companies, and I know there's there's several business owners even on this call who are the, the, the employee 26, employee 50. They might not be those large businesses that I think you're starting to hear at the federal level, them talking about how do we help the, you know, the airlines, the large industry. But, but back here at home, is there anything being discussed for kind of that next level of size of, of, of businesses as we consider future assistance? Yeah, I think Ashley came up with, you know, she, she mentioned uh, some type of state revolving loan fund or something that's going to bridge these gaps. I mean, we have to stand back and take a look. Okay, who's, who's getting the money they need now? Who isn't and why? And then try to shape, um, you know, that loan agreement toward that business that is kind of caught in between. Because obviously, uh, you know, getting a $5,000 grant at a, you know, if you have one or two employees is different from if you have, you know, 45 employees, $5,000 doesn't, go, it just doesn't cover anything. Even $25,000 at that point just isn't going to cover your losses. So we've got to step back and, and figure out how we're going to get the money flowing to those gap areas, those gap services. Yeah, and I'd echo what Liz just said about that. I think I've heard from, I can't tell you how many people who employ that 25 and most of, most of their employees may be part-time and hardly working more than a few hours a week. So there is this like um, narrow gap uh, that wasn't caught in these initial relief programs. So that is definitely something uh, Senator Mathis and I are both advocating for. So if you are one of those people, I would just say, please contact us um, so that we can continue to be that channel of information to the governor's office, because they are continually looking at, uh, could there be another program, another relief program that they do um, in this time, since it is so uncertain as to how long it's going to last. We are running, we are about five minutes over time. So I want to respect everybody's time and, and thank everybody for participating. I don't see any other questions that are submitted. I do want to encourage you, all of the topics that have, have come up, now that we're a few weeks into this, it, it, typically we can point you to a place where whatever your question is, there's, there's online resources for it. Um, we've been working to help navigate uh, those resources, so uh, we want to encourage you to check out um, Medco's COVID-19 resource page. Just go to medcoiowa.org. You will find it quickly. Uh, we talked earlier about um, the unemployment webinars. So Iowa Workforce Development has done unemployment webinars for employees, and then this past week they did one for employers. Um, we have a link to both of those webinars under the video resources section of the website. Um, that I think you'll find them very helpful and would encourage you to, after you, um, after you look at those or after you explore resources, contact us to help us you know, navigate kind of the in-between. 
We've found some good contacts at each of those entities that we can typically get questions back uh, quickly. So we want to help you answer those questions. We want to help point you towards the right resources. So know that uh, between these calls, that's, that's what we're doing. We're helping people broker the right information and resources and, and programs that are uh, available to you. So um, I guess with that, uh, we're going to wrap this up. We're going to uh, keep watching for opportunities to bring you uh, similar types of uh, community conversations like this. Um, we will, this has been recorded. So by this afternoon, we'll seek to post this uh, on our website and across our social media channels. So feel free to share this uh, if you found some of this information uh, valuable to you. So again, everybody, find some time to uh, enjoy the Easter holiday. Enjoy a, a few days to maybe take a quick breath. I know you guys are all uh, looking for ways to be great leaders uh, within your organizations. You're all doing a great job and, and know that we're here to help uh, when, whenever we can help in any way possible. So take care, everybody. Thank you very much.